Uh, thank you, Madam President. Please first allow me to introduce the lawyers who have won midnight, uh, midnight uh, hours to present so many affidavits before you. My name is Ngatia Frederick. I'm assisted by the following lawyers. Mr. Kirago Kimani, Senior Counsel. Mr. Kiyoko Kilukumi, Senior Counsel. Professor Kithuri Kindiki. Mr. Katwa Kigen. Dr. Muthomi Thionkulu. Dr. Linda Musumba. Professor Kivuva Kibwana. Mr. Elias Mutuma. Melissa Ngania, who I had the opportunity to present a, a matter in 2017 with her. Mr. Mwanza Ombati. Mr. Kipchumba Mokomen. Mr. Benson Milimo. Mr. Wilfred Nyamo Mati. Mr. Edward Mureu. Mr. Hirari Sigei. Madam Monica Nyogutu, Mr. Collins Kiprono, Wanjiko Nyaga, Emmanuel Kibet, Ian Shelela, Caroline Cherono, and Chris Ayeko. Most of them are in court number one, following the proceedings very intently. Madam Chief Justice, I rise before you. I know it's been two long days. Please bear with us to oppose the petition filed by several petitioners. It is the first time in the history of this country that we now have eight petitions. It must be a new strategy to disable the president-elect to mount a defense against eight petitions within four days. But we didn't manage the impossible, and we now present our defense as follows. First and foremost, my, lord, my lords, let us appreciate that these consolidated petitions arise from a political, a presidential electoral contest. It is an electoral contest. Ideally situated, or ideally, it should ideally be resolved by electorate, the Kenyan voters, not by a court of law. But because it is also part of the constitutional structure of this country, this honorable court is granted original jurisdiction by the constitution to resolve this contest. But in resolving this contest, it is necessary to, all, all, uh, to bear in mind that all you have are affidavits filed by the contestants. The difficulty with affidavits is that one can structure fiction and pendle it as a pleading, as I'll be demonstrating. I will start with Article 38 of the Constitution because to me that is the beginning of an understanding of this contest. Article 38 is the one that empowers a Kenyan to vote by secret ballot. And that simple sentence can be broken into three or into two parts, voting by secret ballot, meaning it confers on the individual power to exercise a freedom of choice unhindered by anything. Number two, or the second part of it, the vote gives the citizen a power or a badge of dignity for self-actualization self-actualization in the sense that a voter is entitled to vote for a candidate of their choice. Article 38 
to my understanding therefore becomes the beginning of uh, the understanding of the correct situation that is before this court. It is common ground, and this is important, my lords, that on 9th August, voting took place everywhere in this republic. There is not a single place that presidential election was not held. Even in Kakamega, Mombasa, presidential elections were indeed held. There is no area in this country that did not participate in that voting. Accordingly, legitimacy, I go to the next point, legitimacy of the any electoral victory is predicated on the fact that voting did in fact take place. From Article 38, one then goes to Chapter 7 of the Constitution, Article, from Article 31, going all the way to Article 38, uh, no, 81, going to 87, which donates a power to Parliament to legislate on elections. I would immediately say this. Madam Chief Justice, the power to, legis uh, to enact Elections Act, to my mind, relates to the five other tires of elections. For the simple reason that for the presidential contest, the inquiry is, de uh, is defined in Article 140, the relief is defined in uh, the same article, while as in the other levels of elections, one could look at the Elections Act. But I'll come to that a little later. I'm doing first and foremost a broad introduction of the areas that we'll deal with. As I indicated, the scope of inquiry of a presidential context, uh, contest is defined in Article 140. Before you, before you are eight petitions. They have mutated. Now there are seven. Oh, very well. Thank you. They have mutated to a large extent, particularly the primary petition. But my request at this early stage is this, that when you retire to consider your judgment, please carry out some surgery, see the mutations which have been added, remove them so that you are left with the original inquiry under Article 140. Why it is necessary to do so is because other things have been infused in this inquiry like who is to be punished, who is to be castigated, those are not matters that can be dealt with within the purview, limited purview of Article 140. As a matter of fact, when we argued Raira 1 in 2013, this apex court said a petition under Article 140 should be, I quote, concise, precise, and well focused. Well focused. It cannot be a meandering, never ending saga involving other persons other than the inquiry which is specified in Article 140. As I indicated, since elections were held everywhere, that legitimacy then translates to the following. The people of Kenya did express their sovereign will. They did express that on 9th, and what is now under inquiry 
is whether that sovereign will by the 14 million Kenyans is to, start, is to stand unhindered or whether this court would consider any other remedy other than upholding the sovereign will of the voters. Madam Chief Justice, just a few, barely two years ago, Ghana was in the same position that this court is in. They held their elections. A presidential candidate went to the Supreme Court. Identical complaints were made. Complaint number one, ballot staffing. Complaint number two, votes ought to have included rejected votes. Identical with the complaint before you. Complaint number three, the share lady was not being fair to the losing candidate. Identical things. And what is now happening in this new space is that we are all getting the drafting skills of our colleagues in other jurisdictions. Dumping and staging, we learned of it in America not too long ago. It is now before you. Ghana, two years ago, had identical complaints with the complaints which are before you. I pause before I go to the Ghanaian way of resolving this dispute to acknowledge my good friend, the team leader, Mr. Senior Counsel Orengo. He started by saying his case is not based on conspiracy. And he had to do that disclaimer for a good reason. It is the reason that, other than conspiracy, there is no case. And I'll come back to that in a moment. I go back to Ghana. Ghana considered all the evidence that was adduced, and the Ghanaian Supreme Court came to this conclusion that the work of the court in a contest of this kind is to look for a substantive truth. I underline the words substantive truth of the elections. Look for the substantive truth of the elections. That's their Ghanaian approach. Then if you look at the you look at you are able to ascertain the substantive truth of the election, then the next very important values, they call them values, is to try to get finality and stability. Substantive truth of the elections, next layer, st finality and stability. Why is there a need for finality and stability? The whole purpose of these elections is actually to underscore our democracy, our democracy, to have a government in place for the next five years, and then we'll have yet another round of seeking the voters' validation of who will form government. I emphasize the finality and stability because at the end of this contest, what will be bothering this honorable court, if I dare say so, it is what are the reliefs to be given. Elections are carried out by our good Kenyans. I said in 2013, I repeat it again, we are unable to inculcate amongst ourselves the culture of accepting the electoral results. We are just unable to do that. Maybe it is in our psyche, maybe it's in our makeup, but we are unable to do that. Because we are unable to do that, 
we must then come to this honorable court to try and resolve that dispute in a very unfair way because the dispute ought to have been resolved by the rectorate. In my submission, when you look at this case, devoid of lawyers' arguments, you find it is based on certain planks. Plank number one, form 34A was hijacked mid-air, altered votes from one candidate losing candidate petitioner, removed, added to the votes of respondent number one. That is a major plank of it. The easiest way to look at it, because I do not have the ability of Mr. Mahat, who dealt with technology, is to look at it from a point of logic or the antithesis. The antithesis being this. If that is true, if that is true from a point of logic, Show us one form 34A in the public portal, because that is where youth mutility landed, which differs with the one, the hard copy at the polling station. Show us only one. Or show us a ballot box that people from outer space came and voted into, stuffed into it, and then all this hijacking in midair took place. There's no such evidence. And why there's no such evidence is because that is the work of fiction. Work of fiction, not just conspiracy, but work of fiction. In my submission, therefore, amongst the many things this court is now being called upon to do, is to find a way of moderating, I use the word moderating now in the correct sense, the excesses in the political contestants. Excesses such as imagining that this Supreme Court can now take over the role of voters and do a court coronation of any candidate. That would be a heresy. I will be dealing with the reliefs much later. I'm just doing a broad outline and the next broad outline I would wish to do is to indicate to this honorable court that the orders sought in the primary petition, apart from being contradictory, would take this country to a constitutional crisis. We now have the incumbent in office with the limitations in Article 134. Limitations which are set or cast in stone by the Constitution. The incumbent in office cannot even appoint anybody to take over from any of the public officers being vilified before you. If, for example, and I say, for example, guidedly, this honorable court were to even countenance anything other than stability and finality, then a constitutional crisis would be triggered because the petitioner has repeatedly said he will not participate in an election held by IABC under the chairmanship of Shebukati. We have adduced that evidence in the replying affidavit sworn by the first respondent. That replying affidavit is before you. It was filed on 26th August. We have attached a clip of that discussion it's in an affidavit by Samuel Gedai of the same date, 26th August, and all those are matters that are before you. Since the petitioner will not participate, 
in a ele fresh election does not want to accept defeat, then what does he offer? What is the solution he offers? The solution he offers is that there be an election presided over by the vice chair lady of IEBC. And only one needs to state that to see the crisis that this country will be engaged in. It will be a crisis of monumental nature, a crisis that I do not think that you would want to play with that kind of fire because it will be fire upon fire. In my submission, therefore, I would request this Honorable Court, as we begin our submissions, to bear in mind how Ghana resolved an identical situation by, number one, looking for the substantive truth, substantive truth, and then immediately that should trigger a relief which is finality and stability. If this Honorable Court were to do that, I see a future for us. Any other solution, the crisis offered by the petitioner cannot be a crisis that this court can countenance because your fidelity is not to anybody other than the Constitution. Since your fidelity is to the Constitution, I dare say then the reliefs that you could consider are the reliefs within the constitutional structure of this republic. With those comments, Madam Chief Justice, allow me to invite the first counsel to present, who is my good friend, Mr. Katwa Keegan.